When you think of the word meadow, you probably think of an expansive landscape of wildflowers and grasses that, although enjoyable to look at, can feel a bit inaccessible or unrealistic for the home gardener. Today's episode will teach you how to create a tiny meadow in your front yard or backyard so you too can experience the joy of watching a meadow unfurl in front of your eyes and helping your local pollinators while you're at it. Welcome to this fascinating episode on a big topic about tiny plots. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Welcome, plant friends. If you're new here, I'm Maria. I'm your new best plant friend. I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and grow more joy in your life. If you're a repeat listener, welcome back. Thanks for being part of my digital community. So honored to be part of your planty journey and so excited to chat with Graham Laird Gardner today. He's the author of Tiny and Wild, Build a Small Scale Meadow Anywhere. And we're going to talk about how you can have a teensy meadow in your own front or backyard, whether it's in a pot or in a small little square foot area on your lawn. I think this topic of rewilding your lawns, installing pollinator gardens, trying to foster biodiversity in your home plots for your local wildlife has been so popular, but it really can feel intimidating. Because when you think about meadows, it's like a whole nother variety of native plants. It's an entirely different palette, really, of plants than your vegetable garden or your houseplant collection. Graham is such an expert on this. He's such an interesting guy. And we take a deep dive on this topic. And you are going to leave this episode so inspired to the point that once you install your tiny meadows, please share pictures of them with me on Growing Joy with Maria at Instagram. And you know, I thought January would be the perfect time for this episode because we're all kind of leaning into the planning portion of our gardening season, right? Not a lot of us, especially if you're in North America, are gardening outdoors right now. This is where we're cozy. We're dreaming about what we're going to grow in 2024. And so I thought if you've been thinking about trying to do native plants, why not listen to this episode and get inspired and start dreaming about what a tiny little baby meadow would look like in your property. This was such a good interview. I can't wait to dive in. So let's go. Graham, welcome to Growing Joy. I am so excited to have you on this episode after getting requests for meadows, for native plants, for more information on this topic of your incredible book. I am so stoked to have finally found you the perfect guest to answer all these questions I've gotten from my listeners. So welcome. Thank you, Maria. I'm honored to be here. Excited to chat with you. Awesome. So before we dive into this epic conversation about meadows, why they're important, pollinators, and specifically small-scale meadows, which I love because your book makes this concept that can feel very overwhelming, very attainable. But you are the most interesting plants man I have come upon. You've lived all over the world cultivating plants. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got to be the meadow man, but also living in Puerto Rico in an off grid? Like, who are you and how did you become who you are? (laughs) Sure. That's, That's a vast topic. I grew up in Rhode Island. I bounced around a few universities studying different things, and then I discovered landscape architecture. I was part of the Native Plant Society on the board in Rhode Island. Before I even knew what a botanical name was, I was joining their walks and exploring and learning to botanize. My grandparents were both master gardeners and instilled a love of gardening, a passion for gardening. My last name is Gardener, and so... I think it's just in my DNA. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if that was like a faux name or your actual name. Your actual name is Gardner. It is. It is my birth name. So eventually I found landscape architecture and really focused on the plant side of things as I continued to familiarize myself with the importance of native plants. As you mentioned, I've lived in various parts of the country and now I'm in Puerto Rico. So each time that I've relocated, I've made it a point of learning the native plants of that area. And maybe 
his name has come up before for you, but um, entomologist Doug Talame made a huge influence on what I was already kind of intuitively learning about native plants. And his book, his first book, Bringing Nature Home, really just kind of solidified with the science behind it, the importance of native plants for uh, supporting the local ecology, especially insects. He's an entomologist. And once I have that foundation, I did a lot of residential design. I also did nonprofit design, corporate design. And so my focus and the reason that people would hire me was to expose them to native plants, include native plants, different ratios, depending on the project, proximity to wild lands. And then I've been visiting Puerto Rico for about 12 years. I moved here two and a half years ago. It's been the biggest adjustment for sure in terms of learning a whole new set of plants and a whole new environment. Uh, You turn your back on the landscape here and it fills back in in days. So it's, it's it's a completely different space. And I'm really excited, especially learning the local names for plants, the indigenous name names for plants. And yeah, just really challenging myself once again. It's been really fun to bounce around and in various states and learn the native plant palette. So you're off grid in Puerto Rico. What what inspired that move? I have been living on various fincas, farms, and I relocated about six months ago to this farm that because of the issues with unreliable electricity, privatized electricity, the water going on and off, depending on the the electric grid, storms, Maria, Fiona, this particular farm has focused on making sure that they're self-sufficient. So we have solar panels and we use batteries and we bathe in the river and collect water from the spring and rainwater to do the dishes. And that way, as the electric grid fails at times or water might be turned off, we always have access to those things. That is so cool and so nice that you're not having to do it on your own. It sounds like you're kind of in collaboration with people that are running the farm that you're living on. It, yes, it's a collective. So there's a there's a group of us and there are also people that come and stay for a period of time and, and assist based on what their passions are and then transition off. I will be relocating next month to an, another farm while working on an additional farm. So it's been think of bouncing and in a most receptive, kind, welcoming group of people that have appeared in my life. Okay, so before we get into the next project that you're moving to, we need to talk about this project, Meadows. Why a book on Meadows? So initially, when I was younger, I did a lot of formal, traditional, perennial gardens. And I've always loved perennials. I've always loved flowers. And as I began to understand the ecology and the importance of using native plants, the reference would be meadows. So flower forward, grassy prairies and meadows as a way to incorporate more plants more densely, increase biodiversity, welcome various pollinators, support larval host plants or support insects via larval host plants. And there's been a lot of, in the new perennial movement or new naturalism, um, German and Dutch inspiration, as well as from the Sheffield School. There's been a lot of leaders in this that are creating plant communities, referencing the native plant communities nearby. And there's been a wide public acceptance of this. So instead of it just being sort of this messy area when once you introduce the design components to it it's readable and understandable by the public who may not have a lot of experience or understanding of the actual native spaces so i think it taps into my design background and my desire to create beauty but at the same time impacting the ecology and increasing the biodiversity of the landscape Yeah, I feel like lately, I mean, one of my best friends who is not a plant person, she called me the other day, she just bought a house. And she's like, we just we're rewilding our house, we just hired a design firm that's going to rewild our backyard. And I think it's interesting that this opportunity, this whatever you want to call it, regenerative gardening, rewilding, uh, new naturalism, 
this desire for people to reconnect with mother nature, to attract pollinators into their backyard, to give back to mother nature in some capacity. I think it's also like a gateway to get people back into being connected with plants because my friend doesn't have house plants. She doesn't have a garden. She doesn't grow her own food, but she knows that na- native plants are the way to help the earth. And that will be a gateway drug, you know, quote unquote, for getting more involved with nature and plants in general. Is that what you're seeing? Absolutely. It's been widely accepted in, in the 15 or 20 years that I've been exploring the subject where more and more master gardener groups or garden clubs or homeowners are requesting this without needing to be prompted. And so it's, it's quite reassuring. And I think what's fascinating about it is that we used to think of nature as being this place that we would go visit in reserves or national parks or botanic gardens. But now there's this drive to bring it home and just to see nature as separate really disconnects us. We're part of it. And once you have it in your yard and the birds are visiting and the butterflies are visiting and you're noticing different insects and you're not spraying for them because you're not afraid of them, you're curious, you're, you're recording what you're seeing, you're getting excited about it. The impact of that is exponential. The more people that accept and sign on, even if they don't know what they're doing, they just have an instinct that this is what they would like. I think it's, it's really promising. Yeah, you said, you know, to be near nature, but also we are nature, right? Like as human beings, we are nature. And I wouldn't recommend what I did, which was move from 500 square feet in New York City to five acres in the middle of nowhere. Like I really sent it. I went really hard in the paint. But what I've noticed in my three years living in the woods is, you know, my first year, I wouldn't go on my balcony at night because I was scared of the bats. I was convinced the bats were going to come and like bite me and suck my blood like a vampire. So you know what I mean? I'm such an idiot, like such a city girl. We have so many frogs and so many dragonflies because we have a pond. I was terrified of them. I would like run away from the frogs when they were on our... There was one night there were frogs on our walkway to my house. I stayed in my car for 10 minutes trying to like hype myself up because I was so scared of them. And as I've lived here... And I've I watched a documentary on bats and I've like learned more about frogs. I'm obsessed with the frogs now, right? Like I live for the frogs. I'm so excited to go sit next to them in the grass. We love our dragonflies. We watch the bats at night instead of TV. And it's that softening and it's that recognition of, oh, we're all one community, right? Like we're in community with the bats and the hummingbirds and the you know, and and the insects and the frogs, um, that has been a real mind blowing game changer for me. And what I love about your book, which is all about small scale meadows is a lot of people can't do what I did, which was just like run for the hills. Most people live in suburbia, you know, they have a little bit of lawn, they have a little bit of land, but there's so much you can do with that. So I don't think we have to convince anyone. I think everybody's listening to this episode to hopefully by the end of it, be inspired enough to go plant one of their own. But what makes a meadow a meadow? Is my cut flower garden that I have a meadow? Is my perennial garden a meadow? Like what makes it a meadow? And why is having a meadow in your yard better than having just a cut flower, a cut flower garden? Since I'm transitioning into cut flowers, we're intending to arrange them in a meadow-esque style. And so the differentiation, I would say, between a traditional perennial border or traditional agriculture would be the density of the planting, the diversity of the planting, including more species. And a prairie can have 20 to 30 species in a square yard. Wow. So we're talking about really packing it in. And what that does is build in resistance, uh, resiliency, excuse me, so that if you have a particularly dry season or a wet season or one species doesn't do well in the planting, there's all this dynamic social interaction between the plant community that you've created. And so plants will thrive and ebb and flow in the way that they do in the natural world versus the static planting that we would traditionally see in an ornamental garden where each plant has its place. And when one path, one dies, you go out and buy it again and try to fill in the gap. And there's space in between each one. So I would say it's diversity and density that really differentiate in terms of a meadow. And some people have pushed back on whether or not 
a container full of three to five plants is truly a meadow. And I would say that we're using the word loosely. We're taking inspiration from meadows and, and prairies and trying to create a density and a biodiversity and a flower forward, resilient plant community. So on whatever scale that may be, I'm not going to say that you can have too few plants for it to really qualify. If you're being inspired by the meadows around you or the prairies nearby, then I would say you're on the right path. Imagine that beautiful harmony wafting its way through your home while you sit inside bundled up and warm. It reminds me of the Danish term hygge, spelled H-Y-G-G-E, which is all about creating a warm atmosphere and enjoying the good things in life with good people while being cozy. Whenever I hear my wind river wind chimes waft throughout my home, especially in the winter while I'm bundled up inside, it immediately sets me at ease and reminds me to take a mindful moment with a deep breath. So for today's ad, Wind River Chimes is gifting you a moment of coziness to drop in, take a deep breath, and feel all the warm and cozies. This winter, treat yourself or someone you love to the mindfulness and coziness that comes along with these magical Wind River wind chimes and personalize it. You can use the code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com to get a free engraving to any engravable wind chime to add a special element to your gift. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds, so head to windriverchimes.com to listen and learn, and don't forget to use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to receive a free engraving. I am so excited to announce the newest book of my dear friend and mega plant fluencer with millions of followers, Kevin Espiritu from Epic Gardening. He has written a book called Epic Homesteading. So if you follow him on Instagram or TikTok, you know that Kevin has built a modern high-tech homestead on a modest urban lot. It's not that big. And he's proven that self-sufficiency and autonomy can be modern, high-tech, and fun and not require you to go live on a million acres in the middle of nowhere and sacrifice modern conveniences. Epic Homesteading is an accessible, beginner-friendly guide to starting a modern, high-tech homestead with advice on growing and preserving food, raising chickens and bees, my dream, utilizing solar power, harvesting rainwater, and so much more. In Epic Homesteading, you'll find large and small step-by-step DIY projects to power up your homestead quickly. And as an added bonus, Kevin also shares advice on more complex subjects, which you might be interested in, such as investigating local zoning regulations and permitting requirements staying organized, understanding your limitations, and designing your homestead for efficiency and beauty. If you dream, like me, of living a homestead life while enjoying modern convenience, grab Epic Homesteading at your favorite local bookstore, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon.com. That's Epic Homesteading wherever books are sold. Epic Homesteading by Kevin Espiritu. Yeah, I love it. So what are the benefits of adding a meadow to your yard or local community garden? Like why are meadows so important for the earth and for us? I would say insect support, right? We've got a lot of insects that are specialists and they can only reproduce on the plants that they co-evolved with. And insects are the bottom of the trophic scale, which means that they're the ones that are going to feed the birds and all the way up the chart. So When we used to be afraid of insects and we saw insects on our plants and would spray, we're really reducing the ecology and the biodiversity support versus a meadow, as I said, when it's diverse and densely planted, you're inviting so many more insects or wildlife to that space. And a lawn, as probably a lot of your listeners know, it's really green asphalt. It's devoid of ecology especially if you hire a company that sprays all the weeds and gets rid of all the the clover and other things. I'm not anti-lawn. I think lawn should be treated as area rugs, use them in the high use areas, and as much as you can, reduce them. One hour of mowing your lawn is equivalent to driving 300 miles in a car in terms of pollution. And I had also seen recently, and I'm going to say it, and then if we need to correct it later, 
it's 1,400 miles in a car to use a weed whacker for an hour, just based on their lack of ability to filter pollution. So when we convert lawns to meadows, not only are we reducing the pollutants, we're increasing the wildlife support and the biodiversity and the resilience and also the beauty. And I mean, maybe that's personal, but I would much rather watch grasses blow in the wind and be backlit and seed heads being covered in snow in the winter and finches coming to eat the cone flowers than the lawn company coming to mow and blow once a week the whole neighborhood. Yeah, there's something about the wildness of a meadow that I think everybody is so attracted to right now in this like very kind of sterile, especially post COVID germaphobic. I don't know, there's just like something about the wildness of a meadow and being able to bring it home feels so attractive. And I can't wait to talk to you in a little bit about the design of that, because I feel like there's probably a very fine line between wild and just like pure chaos. But let's talk about native plants for a minute, because I think we hear the term native plants a lot, but some people listening might not necessarily understand what a native plant even is. So can you define like what makes a native plant native and what percentage of your meadow needs to be filled with native plants? Sure. That's a great question. It's been an evolution for me, I would say. I started off with some leaders in the native plant movement who were authors and had written books, and they really focused it on North America or the United States. And that's not specific enough. Of course, my book is zone agnostic. And so it it suggests that you look to your local resources. And as I began to understand the importance of these relationships between the insects, you can have the same species on two different sides of a mountain, and they're going to have different flower shapes based on who pollinates them, which is fascinating. So I would say because of the way we think about specifically the United States, political boundaries are the way that a lot of organizations organize their resources. So maybe start there in in terms of looking to your local native plant society, depending on where you live, and then looking for native plants that are native to the state that you live in. There are many, many resources out there that can give you more information. There are plant databases with specific maps for where each species grow. And I would say if you're working adjacent to a natural area that is significant, you may even want to go as far as trying to find plants that are local ecotypes. And that would mean that the seed that grew the plants that you're installing, and this may be too advanced depending on the intent of your project, but that the seeds that grew the plants that you've been installing have been collected within a certain distance from the project site. So that tends to happen more often with nonprofit restoration. But more and more state organizations or native plant societies are recognizing the importance of that, like the morphological features of the flowers and how how different they are, the shapes of the flowers, how different they are, even within the same genus and species. So without getting too deep into the science of it, especially not to intimidate anyone who wants to get started, I would say look to to your native plant societies within your state and see what resources they recommend and lists that they have. That was great. My next question was going to be, where can people look? And it sounds like you're saying go hyper local if you have a local garden society. I want to shout out the Catskill Native Plant Nursery is the native plant mecca for everybody where I live, you know, in the cat, it's 40 minutes for me, but you still drive there. Because the other thing is with these garden centers that have native plants, they're the experts, the people that work there really know what they're growing. And that's something I talk about on this podcast, regardless of what you're growing, whether it's tomatoes or whether it's, you know, houseplants or native plants, go to the people who are already experts and ask them to help you and save yourself some pain. So are all native plants perennials because they're native because they're native to the area. So they're able to withstand whatever seasons you go through, right? So are they all naturally perennials? Not necessarily. They're our biennials and annuals within that palette, it's quite dynamic. And then, of course, if we're not just speaking of meadows, there there are woody plants such as trees and shrubs, which I guess would qualify as perennial as well. But when you think about how a forest develops or how if a lightning strike and a fire happens, suddenly there's a clearing, you're going to have the pioneer species that emerge. And then 
the species that take longer to grow will then come in and be shaded by the early annual or very vigorous growing plants. And eventually it's going to transition, at least in New England, it's going to transition back to a forest unless you're managing it for a meadow. So the shrubs will come in and then eventually the trees will grow. So it's quite dynamic. And I, I also, in thinking about that, there's going to be a lot of potentially invasive plants that will come in in the meantime. And it's important to have an understanding of the plants that are undesirable so that as you welcome the spontaneity of your newly planted meadow, you're not pulling out volunteers that may be welcome. And so really identifying the undesirable plants so that you can manage them instead of just going in and pulling everything that you didn't initially plant. I really, I love the spontaneity of volunteer plants. And if you're not necessarily strong at uh, plant ID, just begin to understand the three to five plants that may be problematic and try to monitor and remove those. And that's another thing that you can find locally. You can go and ask your local garden society, native plant society, native plant nursery, what are the invasive plants I need to be looking for? What do they look like to make sure that you're removed, right? Yes. So is the difference between a meadow and a forest shrubs and trees? Typically, I would say so. Okay, yep. got it. And then, so say I have a house with a lawn and I want to rewild, you know, I want to go for it. I have a feeling your answer is going to be interesting, but what's the smallest amount of lawn to convert that really would still make an impact? Now, I know you said that there's an argument that a small container could still be a meadow, but, you know, say I want to start small and then maybe build year over year. What's, is there a recommended amount of square feet that you start with? I didn't specify that in the book. And that's an, another excellent question. I would say start at the scale that you're comfortable with. Sometimes people will plant around a mailbox, for example, because it's challenging to, to weed wax. Oh, okay. So say that's a three by three area or even a two by three area, a triangle, whatever it is, the spaces that maybe are more challenging to maintain or the areas that you're not walking on, that would be kind of a small scale to get started, to create a small plant palette to begin to learn what the challenges might be, what the successes are. And then once you feel comfortable and get more confident with that smaller space, you can you can double the recipe or triple the recipe and expand upon it. I love that. I love the idea of a mailbox because how annoying is it to mow around your mailbox? That's genius. Or everybody has just like an awkward little area of their front lawn or back lawn that like that never gets walked on, but is awkward and annoying to mow. Okay. What are the components of a meadow? So say I'm thinking about the meadow, you mentioned grasses, you mentioned flowers. Are there key components that I need to be thinking about on a larger scale than just species in order to really get that meadow look? I think grasses are essential. And so grasses or grass-like plants, and I know we may talk about shade in the, during this conversation, but carrots, so sedges or rushes, juncus, those are grass-like plants that also have that same textural component. And then, of course, within the grasses, there are strappy grasses, there are fine grasses, there are tall grasses, there are cool season grasses, warm season grasses. Grasses are essential to the aesthetic, and they can be the matrix or the underpinnings of the more flower-forward, perennials, short-lived uh, or short-flowering season Pops of color, seed heads, and other things, but that I, that would that's sort of the background. And of course, grasses flower as well. Once you become more observant, you'll see how delicate or dramatic or interesting they are. But grasses would be a starting point. And I don't I don't specify a ratio. It really depends on what it is you're trying to achieve. So if if you want a ton of color, then maybe you're only choosing one or two species of grasses as the base before you interplant these other more flower forward perennials or annuals, whatever, whatever it is you choose. And then in terms of proportion or percentage in ter of native, I say that I put, put that back on the individual or the, the family or the, the designer, whomever is kind of going through this process and, and thinking about it. I tended to target for 70% native plants within when I worked for the parks department in Denver we were converting traditional 
bedding plants. So like geraniums and impatiens and all these very fussy but loud colored plants that would get planted in, in late spring and then torn out in the fall. And I was trying to convert these gardens into native plant systems. And I wanted to be aware of the public acceptance of this. So that's why I tended to include plants that weren't native necessarily or a lot of annuals in the first season to make sure that there was still a, enough color, continuous color that was familiar to the public that these conversions wouldn't be too dramatic for them. And I found that the 70% was a good ratio. There are plenty of native plants in every area that are going to, you know, if you look to the bloom time of the species and you stagger that bloom time throughout the season with the choices that you're making, you're going to have color consistently and you can start to track it once it's installed and decide, okay, there's a gap here in late June. Let's find what plant could I in include next year that's going to fill that gap. Yeah, because are you also shooting to have something blooming at all times? Depending on the scale. So if you're working really small, that might not be possible. But that's why I do include self-seeding annuals that are non, non-aggressive, non non-invasive, because they're going to fill in the gaps and provide season-long color. Sometimes I find that by the end of the season, there's too much of that color, and I just want the softness of the transition to fall, and I'll pull them out. But they do... they provide the fireworks in the background. And I think bloom time is an important column to keep when you're making your plant list and, and a, a good consideration. So if you're doing a really small planting, maybe you, you decide that you want to make sure that you have something for spring, summer, and fall. Maybe you're looking at early spring, late spring, early summer, and so on. It just really depends on the number of species you intend to include. And if you're starting simple, it's okay that there are gaps and moments of highlight because you're going to have this texture and movement from the grasses and from the silhouettes of the foliage of the other plants. So it doesn't necessarily have to be entirely focused on the flowering. But I do think that's important to consider, especially if your intention is to support pollinators. You want to extend the bloom time as much as possible without getting too chaotic right? You don't want to have one of everything. <laughs> yes. And I want to ask you one more question before we get into the design, because I feel like my meadow would be extremely chaotic. In terms of maintenance, is the idea that you plant the meadow and then it becomes self-sustaining? Because meadows in nature are, you know, the meadow down my street, like no one's doing anything to that meadow. So is that the thought that if you can properly construct and set it up, that it'll just keep dying back and coming back to life over and over again, and you can kind of just watch it? Or is there a lot of maintenance on a yearly level? Again, excellent question. I would say that meadow maintenance is to reduce maintenance from a traditional perennial border, but there's no such thing as a no maintenance garden. Yeah, of course, of course. And so, especially during establishment, you're going to be wanting to monitor for those potentially aggressive or invasive plants, you're going to probably have to water periodically during establishment, depending on the rainfall and where you live. And then the idea is that you're creating a plant system. And a lot of native meadow species and prairie species like lean soil. So by doing an annual cutback, you're going to be removing the organic matter of cutting them back and raking or blowing it off and then putting that in your compost pile to use in your vegetable plots or in your in your perennial borders and keeping that soil lean. Um, the reason that I recommend the cutback is for the aesthetics. And so you don't have to do that. They can come back year after year. You just will have a very different look than if you tidy it up in late winter. If you have a bulb display, a spring bulb display within your meadow, you're going to want to do a late winter cutback. It's also a good time because the ground will still be frozen and you won't be compacting the soil. If you don't have a large concentration of spring bulbs, you might wait for as long as possible to support the overwintering insects that are in your meadow. And I would say you can put a notes column in your plant list of specific ways to treat specific species so that you extend their bloom time or it's more aesthetically appealing to you especially at a small scale, you're going to kind of treat it more like a jewel box than you would like vast acreage in your backyard or, or in your neighboring plot. I, I think it's a personal decision, but yes, there is maintenance involved. 
the idea is that when you treat it as a plant system, it's actually reducing your maintenance versus the traditional flower model. Than a weekly mow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I love it. So design. Talk to me about design. What are the basic design elements that you need to think about a meadow? To me, it's the like beautiful winding paths in the meadow and it's the, you know, explosion of colors amidst the grasses. But what are the basics that we need to know when thinking about creating our own meadow design wise? So you want to think about site selection first. You want to think of where this is going to be appreciated the most. And so I recommend walking your property. Circulation is key. Where are you going most often? How are you using the property? Is there an, a borrowed view from a neighbor? Is there an area of turf that has been failing that you wish to replace? And then also go inside and look out of the windows that you spend the most time in. Maybe it's over the kitchen sink or across from the sofa. And those will kind of indicate where you want to potentially start this new meadow. And then once you do that, begin to learn about the actual space, the site that you've chosen. Is it dry? Is it wet? Is it full sun? Does it drain well? Those sorts of things. And then those will help inform the limitations and possibilities for which plants to include. In terms of actual design, you want to think about layers. Layers like in a forest, you would have a canopy layer, an understory layer, a shrub layer, an herbaceous layer, which is what we're talking about, the grasses and the perennials, and a ground cover layer. So in the case of a meadow, you're going to have the tall plants that emerge above the rest. You're going to have the medium height plants that are filling in a lot of the space. And then you're going to have the ground cover layer, which instead of using mulch, like you would maybe in a traditional border, you're going to be having green, living, dynamic mulch. So the ratios that I recommend, obviously very loose um, project dependent, is 25% emergent tall species, which you want to be statuesque, placed sporadically throughout, like don't stack them all at the back of the garden. Those might be over 30 inches tall. Then somewhere between 12 and 30 inches is the mid-height plants. Within those, you're going to scatter them, perhaps if if they don't have a lot of distinctive form, like if they're not an architectural plant or if they have a particularly short bloom period, you want to group those so they really are dramatic and maybe repeat the grouping depending on the scale. And then, of course, what often gets overlooked and provides so much, so many services from weed reduction to moisture control to habitat is the ground cover layer. So under 12 inches, it might be clumping plants, it might be spreading plants. Again. They're small, so you want to stack them together so that they read well. And I have suggestions for those in the book for various applications, whether it be a dry, sunny site or a wet site or a shade site. And when you make your plant list, just familiarize yourself with the heights of the plants that you're selecting. And again, it's really important to use botanical names to understand them and be aware of varieties and species so that when you're learning about these plants and you learn that they're you know, say 24 inches tall, and then you go buy something that's you think is the same thing, maybe it turns into 36 inches and, and you're suddenly confused by why that is. So being really specific about the botanic names, even if they're a little cumbersome or unfamiliar to you, will make sure that you're getting what you intended when you started to imagine designing this meadow. Yeah. Is there an ideal sun exposure for a meadow? Is full sun better or can you kind of make a meadow work with whatever sun exposure you've got? In my opinion, you can make it work. You're going to have more flowering full sun and you'll have more choices of flowering plants in full sun. However, a shade meadow is also gorgeous and dynamic. And that's when I mentioned grass like plants. There are so many different carex, sedges and juncus, rushes that provide that texture, that, that dynamism that move in the wind and, and create that matrix that you're going to be planting into. And then, of course, in the Northeast, you have spring ephemerals, so plants that come up and are very flower forward in early spring before the trees leaf out. You can include those. There are wood asters for the fall. So I wouldn't be deterred if your property is mostly shaded. I would say that maybe avoid the north side of your house or evergreen shade because that can be a lot more challenging but it's also possible. So you'll just have a, a far more limited palette. And actually, limitations 
informed design. And there are so many choices out there. So identifying your limitations is actually going to help you to make the best choices. So when designing your wildflower, or sorry, when designing the native plant meadow, how do you walk the line between wild and chaos? Because this is going to be in a lot of people's front lawns. Some people have, you know, the community board or the nosy neighbor that's going to get annoyed. So how do we manage that? Great. I would say you need to use the same design components that you would for other plantings, whether they be annual or traditional perennial gardens. You want repetition. You want groupings. You want a balance between those layers that we discussed. You want to be aware of what the colors are at a given time. Picking harmonious colors. So in terms of color, I tend to lean toward all warm colors with pops of a cool color or all cool colors with pops of a warm color. And don't be afraid of the maintenance aspect, especially in the beginning when a lot of weed species will be entering the space. You can't turn your back. And that's when HOAs will also on HOAs and and neighborhood boards, check your ordinances first get permission. And if you don't have permission, do it in the backyard, because it would be a shame to invest a lot of time and or money imagining something and then start to receive fines, which I know does happen. Keep it simple. And as much as you hear the word biodiversity, if you have a small space, maybe it is only five different species. That can be dynamic in and of itself, especially using repetition. So it sounds like when I'm going to the native plant nursery, or ordering seeds, I'm not buying one of any plant. It sounds like you're getting multiples of every plant that you're buying in order to plant in those clumps or drifts or have a cluster of this grass here. And then you're going to have another cluster of it there. And then another cluster of it there, it's going to be all repeated. And that will anchor the wildness of the look. The other thing I wanted to say was we have these amazing women who homestead on half an acre in Minnesota. And one of them really wanted to have chickens and her HOA didn't allow it, or maybe it was her local government. I don't remember, but like she fought it. Like just because it's not allowed, I also just want to encourage people just because it's not allowed, if you can make a case for it, you might be able to change the rules and maybe inspire your local neighbors to put more native plants in. So I just want to kind of like cheer people on in that too, because you know, lawns are still in a lot of communities, the accepted practice where it doesn't need to be that way. I agree that multiples is the best way to go about it. If you have a particular plant that you're attracted to, but it might not, the description might not fit the site that you're trying to use, that would be the time to get that one plant and do a test, put it in. And then if it thrives, introduce more in the future. Get more. Yeah. Okay. Love that. All right. So depending on if you have lawn, if you have whatever you have in your space, you know, Graham's book has step-by-step instructions for what to do with your lawn. But if you're doing your perennial garden, whatever, you're going to figure out your soil and your pH and stuff like that. Are we doing seeds or are we doing plants? How do you suggest like, because I went down a YouTube warp hole tunnel of seeded meadows where I just was going to do seeds like before the winter and then the seeds were going to sprout. I wasn't extremely successful. I feel like you see a lot of those wildflower seed packs. When you instruct people, are you suggesting that people go buy like full grown plants or can we start with seeds if we have a very small budget? So the great question in terms of it is budget related. What I would caution people is make sure that you know what's in the plant mix of the seed mixes before you purchase them. Meadow in a can, forget about it. Some of the national resellers of what they call native plants, they're going to be filled with short-lived annuals, potentially Eurasian species that can, can escape and become invasive. So actually, seed can be quite expensive. It's going to save you money over a one-gallon plant. It's going to take more time to establish. You're going to have to have a little more familiarity with plant identification, but buy from reputable native plant seed dealers and make sure that you come up with a mix, either working with a representative from the company or from your own research, or potentially they're going to have a New England wildflower mix. Be very diligent about what's in the mix. A lot of times I think people get discouraged with meadows because of 
what happens when you just shake a can and walk away. And what I would say is if you have it in your budget, try to buy small plants, four inch pots. If you have access to landscape plugs, which sometimes can be wholesale only, you might want to work with a designer who has access to them, or you might find a nursery that is willing to sell you small plugs. They mature very quickly and start with plants, full size plants or plants with a good root zone. And that's part of the value engineering that I get into in the book. So once you pick out your plant list and then you multiply the quantity times the cost that you've done the research of, if you suddenly realize this is unattainable, you can phase it between years or seasons, or you might choose to plant those species that are more difficult to find or take longer to grow, and then buy seed, which is going to be less expensive than full-size plants, like I said, and then buy seed and scatter it amongst the plants that you've installed. Yeah, or I guess this is a method I use when I plant basil that my mom taught me, but you buy a large basil plant, you put it in the middle of the pot, and then you surround it with seeds. So as you prune the basil plant, the seeds grow. So I could also see maybe doing the six inch plant and then maybe two inch plugs surrounding it, you know, the little plugs surrounding it and then putting seeds because you said meadows are all about being planted densely. Yes, right. That's a one, actually a wonderful idea. I wish I had included that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, because I had big visions I for this wildflower meadow and uh, the dummy in me, because I'm a new outdoor gardener, I'm a houseplant person, I'm newer on the outdoors. And uh, I did my seeds. And then what I realized, like a true bonehead, is as the seeds were coming up, I couldn't tell what was a weed and what was an actual wildflower, because I was new to the area, it was my first year on the property, and I couldn't tell the weed difference. And so then the garden just got overtaken by weeds. It was like a complete failure. I've uh, documented it on my Instagram. But don't do what I did, plant friends. Go get some real plants. And also you want to see them. You want to see the plants grow in the first year. It's like part of that empowerment and it gives you, you don't feel totally defeated like I felt, I feel like. Yeah, and so that you don't feel overwhelmed, try to learn, like I said, three to five plants that are problematic and monitor for those and allow- Yeah, I should have done that. The others to take their time and fill in. So, because otherwise you're, you're gonna try to teach yourself how to identify all sorts of things that you might- just feel overwhelmed and just figure out which ones are most problematic and stay on top of those as the other plants fill in and be patient with yourself and have know that like gardening is all about experience. I certainly made many, many mistakes over the 30 years that I've been doing this. And, and that's all part of how you get better and how you make better decisions and more successful gardens, less maintenance, smarter, not harder, but that takes time. So be gentle with yourself. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's why it's a lifelong hobby. If you don't fail in your gardening season, you're doing something wrong. You're not taking risks, you know? Absolutely. I think there should be at least one failure every season or like yeah. what are you doing? Being perfect is boring. Right, right. <laughs> why do you think everyone should have a meadow? There's nothing like observing wildlife coming into your yard and the more people that do it, the more we can transform The Talamay said, I believe we have more acreage of lawn and turf. It's the number one irrigated crop in the United States than national parks, square footage. And maybe I'm, I could be a little off on that, but homegrown national park, I think is what the name of the nonprofit is. He was saying that we can have more impact in our own yards by the choices that we make than these wild spaces that thank goodness we preserved, but we have so much impact that could be made at our tiny scale. And I think it's really empowering to remember that while all the things are happening in the world, we still have control over the choices that we make in our own properties. And it's so, for me, so lovely. And like you said, maybe at first you're unfamiliar with this wildlife that's entering and it goes from fear to curiosity to fascination. And then suddenly you're sharing pictures of bugs on Instagram and and wondering who, who you are. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And like, I was going to ask how I'm 34. I was going to ask how old you are. And I was like, I don't know what happened, but I turned 34 and I turned into a crazy bird lady. Like bird watching is in my future. And I think in part, it's because I'm surrounded by such incredible bird species and mm-hmm. the humming, you know, and the hummingbirds. I'm I'm like a crazy hummingbird lady. But 
just one day you wake up and you're like, oh yeah, it's birds for me now. Like that's it. But yeah, you're you're so right. And it's such a beautiful way of reconnecting with nature and allowing that melt for this intense breeze that I think we all have around nature because we've been so disconnected. You're amazing. What is the name of your book? Where can people find it? And where can people find you? Where can people connect with you on Instagram and socials, all those good places too? Sure. So the book is called Tiny and Wild, Build a Small Scale Meadow Anywhere. You can get it in your local bookstore, in your library, on any of the places where you can buy books. It's available in big box, online dealers. It's available for my publisher, Quarto. I've seen it in tiny gift shops scattered throughout New England. I've seen it when I was home in Rhode Island visiting my family. There were 18 people that had requested it at the local library. So there was a hold on it. Oh, local celebrity. Yes, it was pretty fun. And then in terms of reaching out to me, I'm, I'm totally accessible. If you have specific questions, you can find me on Instagram at Native Plantsmith or Native Plantsmith at Gmail is my email. Please feel free to reach out. I love to engage and I'm sure people will have plenty of questions. The book has a ton of resources in it. We only covered some of them. We, I think that this chat was excellent in terms of smattering of all the different ideas and, and concepts that are in the book. And I am really grateful that we had a chance to connect. And yeah, please, if you're interested or have more questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. Well, you're going to be hearing from me because we're moving and hopefully buying our first home this year. And I got big meadow dreams. So I'm going to be sending you maps and plots, (laughs) hopefully. I look forward to it. That'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Maria. Enjoy your day. Thank you so much, Graham, for this amazing conversation. I'm like a little bit obsessed with him after this call. I think he's such an interesting guy, especially, you know, his backstory, his introduction. Grab his book. It's so cute. (laughs) Um, It has amazing pictures of meadows. You're going to get a lot of visuals that will help you understand what we've talked about today. But it also has really good step-by-step tutorials that we could have never gone into in an hour in an hour conversation. But if you're inspired from this conversation and you're interested, his book would be a great next step. It's called Tiny and Wild, Build a Small Scale Meadow Anywhere. We'll put links to his socials in the show notes. I hope this episode gets you inspired. I personally very much believe that we should be growing meadows, not lawns. I cannot wait to install one in our property when we finally acquire it. I hope this brought you as much curiosity and interest as it did me. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.